Hi everyone, welcome to the session on deep learning with imagery and 3D data. My name is Atish Jain and I work as a senior data scientist at Esri R&D Center, New Delhi. It is my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. We have with us today very passionate product engineers, Priyanka Tuteja, Gunid Mutreja, and Vebha Raj, who will be presenting some of the cool work that our team has been doing at the New Delhi R&D Center. Before we start, let us have a quick overview of the session. First up, we will talk about deep learning at a fundamental level. Next, we will touch upon the different types of deep learning models available in ArcGIS. We will follow this up by a quick demo showing how effortlessly a user can use a ready-to-use model. We will then walk through the different user experiences of applying deep learning in the ArcGIS ecosystem. We will then see all these experiences come to life in the super awesome demo section. And finally, we will have the closing remarks followed by Q&A. So let's get started. I'm sure everyone would agree that deep learning is a new buzzword in the tech world. The phenomenal rise of interest in this field is credited to its powerful ability of finding answers to questions which were deemed almost unsolvable just a few decades back. This brings us to the question, what really is deep learning? The graphic on the screen very well captures the relationship of deep learning to AI and machine learning. While the broad goal of AI is to enable a machine to mimic human behavior, it subsets machine learning and deep learning are techniques to achieve AI through algorithms trained on data. In the case of traditional machine learning, handcrafted features are extracted from the input data and algorithms are trained in order to associate a given pattern of features to the desired output. This approach is often challenging because it is often not known precisely what the useful features are for the problem at hand, especially when one does not have adequate domain knowledge. Additionally, even if we know that a feature is important, it may be hard to describe and measure it. Now, that's where deep learning comes to the rescue, enabling us to avoid feature engineering altogether. With adequate amount of data and appropriate tuning of parameters, structures called artificial neural networks can identify the most relevant features from the data on their own and generate the desired output using these features. Deep learning has indeed led to a paradigm shift of AI from feature engineering to select the best features to architecture design for guiding the model toward discovering the best features, creating an impact never seen before. Esri is passionate about enabling its users with tools to apply deep learning for solving complex problems, mainly but not limited to GIS. To this end, we have added a vast variety of models in ArcGIS to handle different types of inputs such as imagery, motion imagery, 3D, text, and tabular data. In this session, we will cover the models that you see on the left namely imagery, 3D, and motion imagery models. The models on the right will be covered in other sessions at the summit. But how do we use these models to make our life easy? That's probably the question in everyone's mind right now. At Esri, we constantly strive to provide our users the ease of applying deep learning to conquer complex tasks. Let me quickly show you how easy it is to apply deep learning to the task of extracting building footprints from imagery. On the living atlas of the world, one can find production grade, ready to use imagery and 3D models, such as the imagery model for building footprint extraction. To set things up, all you need to do is download the model from the living atlas and install deep learning framework using the installer, which can be found at the Esri deep learning frameworks GitHub page. After the setup is done, you need to import the imagery on which you would like to apply the model and open the detect objects using deep learning geoprocessing tool. In here, you need to set the input raster to point to the raster you just imported, set the name of the output feature class, and select the model you downloaded from the living atlas. You can choose to modify parameters such as enabling non-maximum suppression. And in the environments tab, you can set the extent, cell size, and processor type. After doing so, you can click run and see magic unfold in front of your eyes. Well, there you go. The results speak for themselves. 
Let us now quickly look at the different user experiences to fulfill deep learning workflows in ArcGIS ecosystem. In ArcGIS Pro, we have tools such as detect objects using deep learning and classify pixels using deep learning to perform inferencing. Additionally, users can prepare training data by using the export training data for deep learning tool and train their own models by using the train deep learning model tool, all through a simple graphical interface. For users who like to deep dive or those who like to use notebooks to accomplish deep learning workflows, we have the ArcGIS API for Python, which can be readily used in ArcGIS Notebooks or ArcGIS Notebook Server. And lastly, users can perform model training and inferencing at scale using ArcGIS Image Server as part of an ArcGIS Enterprise deployment. With that, we're all set to move to the demo section. Thanks, Atishay. Now, as you can see, we have all kinds of imagery models such as object classification, pixel classification, object detection, and even image translation. In addition to these, we also have super resolution model for image enhancement. And now you're going to see demo of some of these models live in action. Let's see how to use a feature classifier model to classify damaged and undamaged buildings. ArcGIS Pro includes tools for helping with data preparation for deep learning workflows and has been enhanced for deploying trained models. To track the building training samples successfully, you need two things, an input raster that you can see on the screen right now, and a feature class that tells the locations of those buildings. So this is here. Let's zoom in and see how it looks like. In the red, you see the damaged buildings and the, and the green shows the undamaged buildings. Let's see how we can use these two export training data for feature classifier model. Using the export training data for deep learning tool available in the geoprocessing tools, we can export our training data. For that, we just need to provide an input raster, the output folder where we want to export the training data, the labels in the input feature class, and a class value field which tells whether each row is a damaged or an undamaged building. Then we can pass in the parameters like image format, whether we want a chip tip file, a JPEG file, or a PNG file, and we can specify the tile size or the chip size. This is what will be used to tell whether how small each chip of your training data will be. And you can pass the metadata format to label tiles. In the environment tab, you can pass the processing extent and the cell size. Basically, what cell size does is, cell size represents the amount of distance per pixel. For instance, if you're using a projected coordinate system in meters, then setting the cell size to 0.3 will actually convert the output image chips to correspond to 0.3 meters. So after this, you're ready to run the tool. If you click run, the data will start getting exported. Once your data is successfully exported, it will look like this. It will contain all these files. And now we can jump to training the model. For training the model, ArcGIS Pro provides a train deep learning model tool. In this tool, you have to provide the data that you just exported using the export training data tool and provide it here. With that, you can next provide the output model path that will be used to save the trained model. After that, you can provide the model parameters, for example, the model type. Here, we are choosing feature classifier model. And in the advanced options, you can provide learning rate. Now, we are keeping the default as it is. And in the environment tab, you can choose the extent and the processor type. In the processor type, we can choose whether to use a GPU or CPU to train the model. We have used a GPU. Now, we are again set. We can run the tool. Once the tool is run, it will save a folder containing the trained model. And it will look something like this, containing the DLPK file. Now that we have this trained model, we will use it to automatically classify the houses of the portion of the imagery which we do not cover in the training data set. So for that, we will be using a classify objects using deep learning tool. It's available in ArcGIS Pro again. And then we can use this tool to perform classification predictions. It takes the input raster and the trained model as an input. And optionally, we can pass the input features. So here in our case, we have a building features there already. What will this tool do? This tool, if provided the input features, will update the existing feature class containing the buildings with either the damaged or undamaged information. Now, in the class label field, we are providing what name we want to give our predicted attribute. Next, we can shift to environment tab and set the processing extent and cell size to 
please note that our deep learning model performs best when the training and the prediction images are on the same resolution. That is why it is very important to use the same cell size for both export and the inference steps. When you run this tool, you will have an output as a classified feature class, which will look something like this. So I am zooming into one of the extents that shows the results and you can see that the model has classified each building as either damaged or undamaged. Now, what you just saw was about a single label feature classifier model, which means each image will only contain a single label, whether a building, damaged or undamaged. But what if your data has more than one labels? Say solar panels, pools, cars. Export training data tool also supports multi-label tiles format. So you just have to go to the tool and pass in metadata format as multi-label tiles. And then you can follow the same workflow and, and train a feature classifier model. Now, in order for us to deploy a feature classifier model on mobiles and edge devices, we need to first train a model with TensorFlow backend and save it in a TF Lite format. TF Lite models are smaller in size and thus can be easily deployed on edge devices. One of my colleagues has pre-recorded a video to showcase this functionality. Let me show this to you guys. Let's see how you can take AI to the edge now. Here, you're seeing how Survey123 is being used to do a tree inventory. Sandeep, who's doing the field data collection here, is visiting each tree and feeding in the species name. But he's not a trained botanist who knows these species by heart. There are thousands of them. So how can we put AI at work here in identifying these species automatically? This sample notebook uses the Python API to easily train such a model to identify plant species from pictures of their leaves or flowers. Here we are using an openly available dataset containing over 260,000 images of plants across 10,000 species. We are creating the plant identification model and what's special here is that we are specifying the backend to be TensorFlow. The same training methodology that you've already seen and once you've trained the model, you can see how it's doing a great job at identifying all these plants. Once we've trained the model, we can save it out to a TensorFlow Lite model that's ready to be deployed on mobile devices. Survey123 is running a beta program to integrate such models for on-device inference. So let's see this in action. The surveyor can start the Survey123 app on their phone, open the survey and begin their tree inventory. And instead of scrolling through thousands of plant species, they can simply point their camera at leaves of that plant and they are done. The AI model correctly identifies that plant and fills it out for you, eliminating the need to go through that long pick list of plant species. The model is running on the phone itself in a completely disconnected environment. After completing the survey, you can connect back online and share the data with our organization's portal. That data layer is feeding into this web app where we can observe the results of the survey. We can click at each location and find a picture of the plant as well as its classification. Using machine learning at the edge, we are putting AI into the hands of our users and enabling them to solve real world problems. ArcGIS image server in the ArcGIS enterprise has similar capabilities. It provides a suite of deep learning tools with end-to-end -to -end workflows to classify and detect objects in an imagery. ArcGIS notebooks provide a ready-to-use environment for training deep learning models. We already have a notebook created in ArcGIS notebook server. And let's see how we can use image servers and ArcGIS notebooks to extract building footprints in areas where we do not have them. So, to create the training data, I have first imported the export training data function. And then I have searched for the input raster and the building feature label. This is how the input raster looks like. And then I've searched for the raster store and specified a folder name in the raster store that will be used to store our training data. To train a model that can classify pixels in an imagery, we need to export training data in the classified tiles format. 
to train a model, we need to import prepare data and unit classifier model. Then we can pass the path of the exported data into the prepare data function. And we can choose the chip size according to what we had used while exporting our data. And we can also choose the batch size according to our GPU capacity. Once the prepare data function is run, it will create a data bunch. And you can run data.showbatch to visualize your training data set. It shows the ground truth with building footprints which have been overlaid on top of the imagery here in pink. We can then instantiate a model by passing the data object and that will create a model object. And then we can run model.lrfind to find an appropriate learning rate. This learning rate can be fed into the fit method and that will help us to train our model. As we see the loss is going down for both training and the validation losses. And we can visualize the results of the model in model.show results. Once you have a well-trained model, you can choose to save the model using the save function. This was about model training. Finally comes model inferencing. So this time we performed inferencing using image server with raster analytics capability. All that was needed was getting the imagery layer. And to process this imagery, we actually what we actually did this processing on larger extent. All we need to do is call the classify pixels function. And in this case, we used a four machine raster analytics cluster consisting of cloud GPUs with 24 GBs of memory each and processing a larger area of interest covering over 60,000 buildings only took 20 minutes. That's at the speed of generating 3000 buildings every minute. Now let's switch back to pro and look at some of the examples of the kinds of footprints that were created. Because the model that we trained was a pixel classification model, it only classifies each pixel as belonging to a building or not. And hence the results are not so perfect. So that's where the post processing in ArcGIS comes in handy. Using which we can go from these mask of buildings to the regularized building footprints. Let's see how the regularized building footprints look like. So you can see how deep learning has done an excellent job in extracting the building footprints. Well, thank you Priyanka. Guys, consider the scenario of Earth observation on a cloudy day. Use of optical imagery at that point in time may not be of much use. So here comes the role of SAR that can penetrate through these clouds and can show you the actual picture on the ground. But SAR has its own disadvantages of less familiarity and complexity to use. Let us see what we can do about it. One such idea is to convert this SAR image into RGB, which is much more familiar so that we can make use of it. But well, can that be done? Yes, that can be done using image translation models in deep learning. One such image translation model is CycleGAN that we have recently added to ArcGIS Learn and made use of that to solve this kind of problem. For that, the data we have is the SAR imagery acquired from Kepler Space, which is a single band image. We converted that to a three band imagery using extract bands raster function. Once we do that, we also have the RGB imagery available here, which is Esri's world imagery. Now, once we have the data prepared, we can now use the tool export training data for deep learning to export these imagery in export tiles format. So once we run it, you'd be able to see the tiles exported like this. Now you can make use of these tiles to train a model. Now let me jump to Jupyter Notebook to show you how you can do that. Firstly, you need to import the CycleGAN model from the ArcGIS.learn library. Now you can make use of prepare data function to prepare the data, data bunch so that can be used by our model to get trained upon. Use show batch to see how the data look like. Here on the left are the ground truth SAR imagery on the right are the ground truth RGB imagery. They do not resemble with each other because CycleGAN works on unpaired data set. Now it's time to call the CycleGAN model and pass the data in it. You can make use of LRFind to find the best learning rate for you to train the model. Use the fit to train the model for a number of epochs. We have trained it for 25 epochs. And as you can see in the table here, the training loss and validation loss, which started from a higher value, went down to a lower value, indicating that model has learned something. Now it's time to validate its learning. 
you can use show results to validate it. Now here there are two sections the left and the right. The left one are the ground truth pictures and the right one are the predicted ones. So left side onto the left is a SAR image and left side of the right section is the predicted RGB image and vice versa. You can save the model once you are satisfied with the performance using the model.save function. Now you can also make use of predict function in order to predict on a particular image and convert it to a particular category. In our case, the SAR image were belonging to category A. So we converted them to category B and here is the result. I also have tried converting category B that is RGB to SAR and here is that result. Now let me jump back to ArcGIS Pro to show you how you can do inferencing of the model that you have trained on a larger extent. Now for that we have classify pixels using deep learning tool. Parse in your three band SAR imagery here and the model definition and click on run. Once you do that you'll be able to see results something like this. So here as you can see this whole imagery is the predicted one that we have achieved. Thank you so much. Manually digitizing parcel boundaries is a time consuming task. Automation of this hectic task using AI can surely save time and other resources. Let us now see how we can extract land parcels from imagery using dash direction models like bidirectional cascade network BDCN and holistically nested S detection HED, in ArcGIS.learn. Here we have the world imagery and land parcel boundaries available for a small portion of Belmont city in US. In order to train edge detection model to automatically predict these parcel boundaries for the nearby areas, we'll first use export training data for deep learning tool to export the training chips from this data. In the interest of time, I have pre-populated all the parameters in the tool. Here, we have passed the input raster, feature class, and set the metadata format as classified tiles. We have also set the cell size in the environment tab to 0.2. In the generated output, you will see chips exported, which will look like this. Now, let me take you to the Jupyter Notebook to show you how you can train the model. Here, firstly, you need to import BDCN as detector and prepare data from ArcGIS.learn. Secondly, use prepare data and pass in the data which you have just exported. Now, you can use show batch to see how your data actually look like. Then call the detector and pass the prepared data to it. Use LR find to get an optimal learning rate to train your model and use fit to start fitting it. You can see how the losses went down from a higher value to a lower value, indicating this model has learned something. Use show results to actually see how your model is performing. The results are not perfect here, but we'll see how they can be cleaned up in the post processing steps later on. Once satisfied, you can save the model. Now let us see how you can use the model to get the parcel boundaries for the nearby areas. So for that, I have this nearby area, this imagery which model has not seen earlier by training. Now we'll, we'll make use of classify pixels using deep learning tool. We have passed in the imagery raster and the model we have just trained. When you click on run, you will see results which will look something like this. Now these results require post-processing and this is a task where RGS Pro accepts. It provides unique set of tools to perform any type of post-processing quite easily. We have created a chain of tools using the model builder to post-process these results. And once you use it, you'll get final results which will look something like this. Let me show you how deep learning can be used to perform change detection using satellite images. For this, I'll be using a change detector model that identifies areas of persistent change between two different time periods using remotely sensed images. It can help you identify where new buildings have come up, for instance. This model is based on the latest research in deep learning and works well with objects of various sizes. So here I have 2014 raster folders, 2020 raster folders and the corresponding labels. This is a sample imagery for, from each of the following folders a before image, an after image, and then the labels. These images are too large to process in the GPU memory for training a model. So, we need to create smaller chips or tiles. For that, I'll be using export training data for deep learning tool. Let's see how to do that. In the input raster, we can either provide a single raster or we can provide an image collection. So here I have provided the folder containing 2014 rasters. 
and in the output folder i am providing the folder folder name as images underscore before now we don't want to export chips for the areas where there are no changes as this can introduce class imbalancing in the exported data so to avoid that we will provide a polygon feature class into the input mask polygons parameter and that will delineate the area where the chips will be exported now we are set to run the tool once the tool is completely run the training data will look something like this so it will only export the images before folder for now and you will have to rerun the tool three times once for 2014 rasters second time for 2020 rasters and the third time for the corresponding labels and finally when you run the tool three times your training data will contain three folders images after images before and the labels once again time to train the model now we have to get the necessary imports and then create a data bunch by passing the exported data into the prepare data function and here to remember to specify the data set type as change detection the data dot show batch can be used to visualize training data the first column here shows the images before the second column shows the after images and the rightmost shows where there are changes among them and then then we can instantiate the model by passing the data object and specifying the backbone that we need once the model object is created we can find an appropriate learning rate and use that to train the model we can pass the lr find into the fit method that will train our model to visualize the results that the model has predicted we can use show we can then model dot show results and this is how the output looks like the the third column shows the actual results and the fourth column is showing the predicted results from the model with each iteration of the model we train further you will see that the results are improving if you have a well trained model you could save it using the save function change detector model also has a predict method which can be used to predict on a pair of images so we can provide a before image an after image and pass visualize equals to true optionally if you want to visualize the results in the notebook optionally we can also pass save equals true to save the results predicted by the model in the local disk well we also have support for change detector model in arcgis pro for that we need to run classify pixels using deep learning tool some of you might be thinking which raster should be provided in the input raster since there are two rasters of two different time periods we need to use both of them for that we have to first use composite bands tool this tool uses the before raster and the after raster and combines it to create a composite band raster then we can feed this raster into the classify pixels using deep learning tool along with the model definition and we can again choose the environment settings as setting the cell size to 0.3 and the processor type to gpu and run the tool the output results in a raster with binary values either a change or no change so here you see that the change detector model is able to identify and segment buildings that have been newly constructed in 2020 semantic segmentation models like unit classifier pspnet or deep lab can classify road pixels however road network from satellite imagery often produce fragmented road segments sometimes because of shadows on clouds trees or because of similarity of road texture with other material so we have yet another model for pixel classification that could improve the road connectivity and generated road masks for example in this image on the left you see the results generated by unit classifier model which hasn't generated a connected road network whereas on the right you see a multitask road extractor model result which has done a pretty good job this model also performs orientation along with segmentation which gives better road connectivity end to end workflow to use multitask road extractor model is similar to how you saw in the previous pixel classification models that includes exporting training data training the model and then using the train model to get predictions over a new region as an input we have provided the is input raster and these are the polygons that are available as labels and in this export training data tool i have provided the buffer here because we can't provide the polylines instead we need the polygons and to get the polygons i provided the buffer here The rest of the parameters are similar, and metadata format as classified tiles, and we exported the training data. So to train a model, we have again created a data bunch using the prepare data function. This is how our training data looks like, and then we have instantiated the model by passing data. And here in this case, we provided an MTL model, which can either be uh, Hourglass or LinkNet, and then we can train the model using the fit method. And this is how the results from the model looks like. 
Finally, we have saved the model and we are again moving to FastJS Pro for inferencing and we have again used classify pixels using deep learning tool. Let me just show you how the final results looked like. Here you can see that the model has predicted a road network. Let's zoom in to see the road clearly and let me also change the color here and we can get no color and maybe red. So you could see how the road network has been generated. And Gunit, who's there with us, will now show you how multitask road extractor model is not just limited to extracting roads, but could also extract water streams. Over to you, Gunit. Not only roads, but many other types of features are linear in nature. Let us consider streams. Based on the similarities in roads and streams, we tried using multitask road extractor model to extract streams and got some amazing results. Let me set the context here. We tried to extract streams using three different geomorphological characteristics derived from a 5 meter resolution gem in one of the watersheds of Alaska. These three characteristics are topographic position index, topographic wetness index and geomorphon landform. We created a composite out of it and this is how it looked like. Now we used export raster tool to convert the scale pixel values to 8 bit unsigned. Now we used export training data tool to export imagery chips out of it. Now these chips were then used to train the model with our glass backbone for 10 epochs. The saved model was then used to perform inferencing using classified pixels using deep learning tool. As you can see, the model has rightly identified the streams and it has also identified a few missing streams in this section. Now this workflow shows how easily you can combine traditional morphological landform characteristics with deep learning methodologies making use of the multispectral support from ArcGIS.learn to detect streams. Till now, what we have seen is how you can train and inference deep learning models using ArcGIS.learn. But what if we already have a deep learning model trained on some other platform and we just want to use that for inferencing in ArcGIS Pro? Can that be done? Well, yes, ArcGIS provides support for just that using deep learning Python raster functions. Let me just provide you a little context here. What we are going to do is we are going to use a predefined face detection model to detect faces for an image in ArcGIS Pro. We'll also explore a few ways to modify the model's output to blur these faces. To make use of it, you just require ArcGIS Pro version 2.3 or later, an ArcGIS image analysis license, and obviously a CUDA enabled CPU or G. Let us do that right now. I'm going to download a very popular face detection model MTCNN from this repository. And once you download it, it will look something like this. Here, in this MTCNN folder, you have a folder with the name data. Data has the pre-trained weights, which tells us that the model is already trained and you can directly call it to detect faces. Now, in order for me to use this model in ArcGIS Pro, I need to define an S3 model definition and a Python raster function. So this Python raster function, I have named it as face detection.py. Let us first explore what that is. Here in this Python raster function, you just need to modify five basic functions, namely initialize. This is where the model initialization process will comes up. Then get parameter info. Here we will define the custom parameters for our model. In our case, we have the two score threshold and minimum face size. Then you have the get configuration. So this get configuration will have the configuration for the parameters that you have defined above. Then you just need to define the get geometry type that will have the output feature type. Then the last one is vectorize. This is where the actual magic happens. This is where the detection happens. Here we are calling detect faces, which is a method provided by MTCNN model to get the detected features and performing some post processing to show these results. That's it. This is the Python raster function that you need to define. Now let us jump to Esri model definition. The EMD file will have the inference function, which is the same Python raster function file that we have just created. Just mention the bands, the classes, and the image space used and that's it. Now let's see this in action. Opening ArcGIS Pro, 
load an image which has some faces, pass the input raster, the face detection dot emd, and recall these two functions score threshold and min face size that we defined in get parameter info function in the PRF, and just hit run. When you do that, you'll get the faces detected. Now, as promised, let us also explore some ways to blur this face. Now we have these two functions update raster info and update pixels here. The update raster info will have the output type defined and the update pixels will have the code to blur those faces. Now let me jump back to RGS Pro. Now we'll use classify pixels using deep learning tool to blur this one. We have passed the image and again the face direction of EMD. Just click on run and you will get a new image with the face blurred here. All this while we've been talking about how deep learning can help us accomplish complex workflows. Well, there are many workflows which can be accomplished even without using deep learning. Let me demonstrate one such workflow using the scan map digitizer class in learn module of ArcGIS API for Python. The scan map digitizer class helps the user to process scan maps such as the one you see on the screen and georeference and digitize them as shape files. Let us start by importing ScanMap Digitizer from ArcGIS.learn and creating an object instance by passing the path to the ScanMaps directory and path to the output folder. Next, we create the masks corresponding to the colored regions of the input using the Create Mask API. This API accepts a list of mean RGB color values, the delta value for creating a range around the mean color values, the size of the kernel for post-processing the generated masks, and the kernel type. The output can be seen by setting Show Result Parameter to True. We then create a template image corresponding to the land region of the scan map by using the Create Template Image API. This API takes as input the land RGB color value, the delta value for defining a range around the land color value, and kernel size for post-processing dilation operation. The output can again be visualized using the Show Result parameter. The next step is to set the extent of the search region in which we wish to find the template image. Using the set search region extent API, we set the spatial reference defined using a well-known ID and the values defining the latitudinal and longitudinal ranges. We then call the prepare search region API to create a search region image on which we can find a match to the template image we created just a while back. This API accepts the search image in raster or shapefile format, RGB color value corresponding to water, search extent which can be the same as the search region extent defined above or an extent within the search region extent and finally the image height and image width. Setting the show result parameter to true we can see the prepared binary search region image. Next we apply multi-scale template matching using match template multi-scale API in order to match the template image to a region on the prepared search region image. To this API we pass the minimum scale maximum scale and the number of scales at which template matching is to be performed. Again, using the show result parameter, we see that a match has been successfully found. We then georeference the image using georeference image API. This API accepts a tuple representing padding in the X and Y directions respectively applied to the detected region. With show result set as true, we can see how control points on the scan map have been matched to those on the search region to help us generate the transformed image. Finally, to digitize the colored regions of the scan map, we use the digitize image API, which again takes show result parameter to display the output. Importing the results in ArcGIS Pro, we see that the georeferenced image finds the right place on the world map. We also notice that the digitized color region sits very well on top of the colored region in the georeferenced scan map. Now that we know how the workflow functions for a single scan map, let's visualize the results obtained after processing multiple scan maps in a web scene. As you can see, this web layer contains multiple polygons. When we click on a region, we can view all the polygons contained within it by scrolling through the list in the pop-up window. You can observe that the scan map which is used to generate the polygon is displayed as an attachment beside the selection. So there you go, thousands of scan maps automatically georeferenced and digitized. Hi, I'll be talking about 3D deep learning. In this section, I'll start with the deep learning capabilities available in 
ArcGIS API for Python for 3D data and then I'll talk about some use cases and lastly I'll talk about ready to use models for 3D data. Let's see the 3D deep learning capabilities available in ArcGIS API for Python. API has point scene and model which can be used for classification of point clouds. It only takes an easy 5 to 6 lines of code to train a model and inference using the train model. The supported format for point clouds in the workflow is last format. Let's take a quick overview of the whole process. First, we arrange our data in a specific folder structure. Train has training data, val has validation data. Then the last files are exported to an intermediate format. Point CNN learns the actual geometry from a block. The dimension of this block, max points, these are controlled at this stage. Apart from that, one can also select extra attributes like intensity, number of returns too. Next, exported files are parsed in prepare data, uh, which will prepare the data that will be used for model training. After this, optionally, one can visualize the data within the notebook. Next, the model is initialized and an appropriate learning rate is calculated. After this, the model is trained using FIT, where we use the calculated learning rate. After training the model, we can visualize the results within the notebook. On the left, you can see the ground truth. On the right, you can see the predictions. Now we'll save our train model using save for future use. And for inferencing, we can use predict class. Now within predict class, we can remap the classes or we can selectively classify a subset of classes or we can preserve classes uh, which are present in the input data set. This completes the whole workflow of 3D deep learning capabilities in the API. Now after the quick overview of point CNN workflow in the API, let's see some of the sample predictions where different point CNN models were trained for different object of interest. Now this particular scene a model was trained for bridges and buildings. So green is bridges and brown is buildings and gray is everything else. Uh, another case can be where a point scene model can be trained for wire or poles. So what we can see here is that the wires are depicted by yellow and the pole is depicted by blue. We can also train a model for let's say vegetation and everything else. So this is a forest area where the vegetation is in green and uh, the gray is everything else. Similarly, some unique object of interest can be traffic lights or in this particular case, these are street level tram wires. So in the center of the street or uh, this uh, set of wires are train wires. So we can train our points in model for these unique object of interest too. Let me introduce you all to ready to use models for 3D data, which are available on Living Atlas. Currently, there are two 3D models, one for power lines, another for tree points. Two key aspects I want to highlight for these ready to use models. First, both models expect the input point clouds to be in metric coordinate system. Second, both models are expected to work well globally, but results can vary for data sets, which are statistically dissimilar to to our training data. To help with that, detailed information about the training data are provided in the item description of these models. Let's talk about tree point model. It can classify tree points or we can call it medium to high vegetation. This model needs XYZ and number of returns in the input data. Tree point model is also integrated with 3D base map solution to classify tree points via deep learning. Without any programming, with the help of easy to follow tasks and tools, user can generate impressive 3D base maps. Next is power line model. It can classify power lines, poles, and sideware. It only needs XYZ in the input data. Currently, this model can be utilized using ArcGIS API for Python. One can download the DLPK and use it with predict class after loading the model using from model. We are working on more and improved version of existing models, which can work with different set of attributes like intensity or RGB along with XYZ, so that not only LIDAR point clouds, but different sources of data like SFM point clouds from drone imagery can also be used with these models. 
What you see on the screen is a classic example of overhead motion imagery. So far, we have seen how we can accomplish deep learning workflows using imagery and 3D data as input. Wouldn't it be cool if I told you that you can now use state-of-the-art object tracking models such as CMMask in ArcGIS.learn to process videos? What if I additionally told you that object detectors such as RetinaNet, which are already part of the Learn module, can be used in tandem? All of this is now possible through the Object Tracker class. Let us see how we can build a simple application to count the number of cars passing through the exit point of a parking lot defined using a rectangular region of interest, also known as ROI. We first import CMMask RetinaNet Object Tracker from ArcGIS.learn. We make use of OpenCV and hence we import CV2 as well. We then declare a set to store the unique track IDs of tracks returned by the tracker, which we will shortly use to calculate the count of objects. We then initialize parameters such as tracker options and ROI and define helper functions. We then instantiate the CMMask model by passing the path to a pre-trained model to the from model API of CMMask. Similarly, we create the RetinaNet model. We then create an object of object tracker class by passing the CMMask model, RetinaNet model and tracker options. We then instantiate video capture and video writer objects to read and write frames respectively. To initialize the tracker, we read the first frame and call the init API. Similarly, for the rest of the frames, we call the update API and add the track IDs of tracks returned by the tracker to unique track IDs. We then find the length of unique track IDs, which gives us the final count of cars. Well, that brings us to the end of the demo section. Before we head to Q&A, let me point out a few useful resources. On the ArcGIS developer's site, you can find the guide, samples and API reference for ArcGIS.learn module. To try out samples on your local machine, you could clone the GitHub repo, the link for which is on the screen. Additionally, everyone is recommended to check out blogs on Medium Geo AI page and videos posted on YouTube. With that, we're all set to move to Q&A. Hi everyone, it's great to have you join us today. My name is Atishe and I'm the moderator for this session. I have with me Priyanka, Guneet and Webhav who are eagerly waiting to respond to your queries. We will try our level best to answer as many questions as possible. Just in case few questions are left unanswered, we will reach out to you using the contact details that you may have provided. Alternatively, you may choose to visit Ask Our Experts Python section and post your queries there. We will do our best to get them answered for you. Without further delay, let's get started with the Q&A. So the first question is, with the Deep Learning Frameworks installer, is it still necessary to clone the default Python environment? Would you like to respond to that, uh, Priyanka? Yeah, thanks, Atishe. So um, for uh, you know creating a deep learning environment um, using the deep learning installer or the deep learning frameworks, it's not really necessary to clone the environment, although Whichever environment is set default in your ArcGIS Pro, that would be used, and that would, you know, a Pro installer would use that environment and, and set up a deep learning environment for you there. So just make sure that your, your default environment is set to the desired environment you want to create the deep learning environment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Priyanka. The next question that I see here is Do you have any built in model for trees extraction? If not, do you have any suggestions for trees extraction or classification or canopy measurement? I think Webhav, you will be the best person to respond to this. Yeah, so uh, basically we have a pre-trained model for tree point classification. If you want to detect trees or classify trees in 3D data, we don't have a tree pre-trained model in imagery, but you can you uh, train your own uh, detect uh, model, I mean model for detection using SSD or YOLO uh, for like detecting trees in imagery. So uh, let's talk about the 3D workflow. So for 3D workflow, you can, after the classification uh, using our pre-trained model, or uh, if you are training your own model, then also it's fine. Uh, you can use the GP tools available in ArcGIS Pro, like uh, minimum bonding volume, minimum bonding area, and uh, zonal stats. So these will help you in getting these measurements like tree canopy and uh, like uh, tree height and canopy height, things like these. A similar demo, I've also like uh, uh, pasted a link to it uh, in the chat uh, to that particular question. So you can visit that link and you will get a uh, like idea of the workflow. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Atish. Thanks, Weber. 
the question which we will take up next is, is the TensorFlow Lite model for plants you showed available for download for tests on the customer side, or do we need to train it once again? Would it be fine if I direct this one to you, Priyanka? Yeah, sure, Atishai. So um, I would first like to tell that uh, we have been now having a tried live option available on AGOL, geosaurus.maps.com. So uh, all the samples that are available there, some of them are made tried live and we soon plan to make all of those samples tried live. But before that, um, we, are, we are in progress and we're working on providing the models and the uh, training data. So I hope we'll soon have that available uh, and, and the customer will, will then be able to apply that. Yeah. Thanks Priyanka. One more interesting question posted is, what are the experiences about the number of samples needed to train an image classification model? For example, to detect cranes on satellite images. Can you take this one as well, Priyanka? Uh, can you repeat the question once? I'm not what are the that. experiences about the number of samples needed to train an image classification model? For example, yeah. to detect cranes on satellite images. Yep. Yeah, so for an image classification model, we have feature classifier available, a feature classifier model, which works either with label tiles, which is single class, and with multi-label tiles format, which is multi, you know, classes. And uh, the way how usually all the deep learning models work is that we should provide the, the more the training data, the better is the model. So it depends. I would suggest that we have one sample notebook for vehicle detection and tracking. Say that uses, I think, 200 um, images of training data. And that works well. So it depends on the use case and the, and the type of object. I would suggest that, you know, you should first start with 200 and then keep increasing and checking if, if you know, if the minimum amount of data that you can use to train a more good model. Okay, thanks Priyanka. Let's move on to the next question now. I would like to ask about the demo where you use the export training data. What is the best practice to set chip size? I noticed that the stride parameter is not half of the chip size. When should we use stride as half size of the chip size and when another sizes for stride parameter. I think Guneet can respond to this one. Yeah, thanks Atishay. So uh, it depends. It depends on the use case you are trying to solve. I would say uh, the object size you have and the cell size of the imagery you have, uh, that is the best way or best, that is uh, what you have to look to uh, determine the best chip size for exporting the data. Also, the stride parameter is actually not designed in such a way that uh, it, it is always half the size of the chip chip size. Uh, it is just uh, to increase the uh, amount of training data you have. In case you have a very low training data, you can use a stride parameter to increase your data so that it will eventually help you up in training that model. Yeah. Thanks, Vineet. So the next question is, could you speak about if GPU is used in the demo cases and how to monitor GPU usage. Let me request WebHub to respond to this. Yeah, so basically uh, the most effective way would be using NVIDIA SMI. But if on your system due to old uh, driver, it's not working on the command prompt or whether you're working on Linux system. Uh, then other way you can uh, uh, use function within torch. Uh, I have pasted that uh, in the uh, in this particular for the reply for this particular question. And alternate on Windows system, you can just switch to task manager. Within that you have a GPU section for your GPU. And uh, within that you have graphs. And for that, if you can just select CUDA, then even you can easily see the CUDA usage. And in the same page, if you just scroll down, then you can see how much GPU memory is being used. Yeah, back to you. Atish. Thanks, Webhav. Yep. There's another one which reads, uh, when extracting buildings from LiDAR, you usually get a lot of false positives. What are some suggestions on extracting the most accurate building footprints? I'll pass this one to Guneet. Yeah, thanks, Atishay. So uh, 
for this specific question, we actually have a sample case, uh, sample notebook for uh, sample notebook with us. I'll be posting that on the chat. Uh, so with the LIDAR data, actually we converted that to uh, DSM and you can directly use that up. Uh, that will be a single band imagery. And if you, again, you can try training it further for more number of epochs and still you see uh, you're not getting better results, then uh, best would be to have a newer data. Let's say uh, you use four band imagery. That is you are merging the DSM data with the RGB and then you try to train the model to see uh, if you get any results better because in that case, there'll be four uh, different uh, parameters for any single chip, there'll be four bands. So model will have more uh, parameters to learn and it may result in uh, in less false positives. Thanks, Vineet. Another question is, do you need imagery server for the extract building footprint notebook demo? Would you like to take this up, Priyanka? Yeah, sure, Atishai. So so this question, I think there is one more question I see that's related and that says that, do we need to have raster analytics or ArcGIS Pro is enough? So to answer the question that you asked, um, I would say imagery image server is needed once we want to use distributed analytics and want to you know perform inferencing. And um, for those who want to only you know perform inferencing using a single machine and over a smaller area, they might use a single system. And for that, ArcGIS should be enough. Um, but raster analytics is useful for um, disputed analysis. Yeah. OK. Oh, thanks, Priyanka. I think I can take the next one. If my model is trained in a 10 meter resolution imagery, can I use the same model for inferencing other resolution imagery as well? So to answer that, uh, I would say that to get superior results, it is always recommended to use the same resolution imagery during inference as was used while training the model. So with that, let's move on to the next question. In your demo valid loss values were constantly lowering. I saw in several cases that these values lowering at first, but then they jumped to a value which is high and then it has started lowering again. Are these jumps a mark of instability or bad testing data or just normal behavior? I would like to pass this one to Guneet. Thanks, Atishay. So the conversions of any of the model, it usually takes a lot of time. And uh, it is only after looking at the trend, uh, you decide whether the model has converged or not. So it's it's basically normal behavior to see such uh, surges in between of one of the epoch. But yeah, you should always consider the whole trend uh, before saving the model. Thanks, Kuneet. So the next question we have here is, can we have example notebooks for all the models and functions of ArcGIS.learn by default? I struggle sometimes finding out how to prepare data or pick options to get some of the newer, more involved models to run properly. For example, point CNN. Webhav, can you take this one? Yeah, so uh, basically I have posted the link for point CNN guide and uh, sample notebook, but we keep on releasing uh, sample notebook and guide for uh, new re uh, released models. And apart from that, I have posted another link, uh, which is uh, to a YouTube playlist where you will find some of these newly added uh, models uh, in the API. So you can check those out. And uh, there we have uh, like uh, explained all these steps in detail. So, and otherwise you can reach us, uh, like if you face any difficulty, you can also reach us on GeoNet community. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vavav. Back to you, yeah, back to you, Atish. The next question we can take is, what are you using to build these models? Priyanka, would you want to take a shot at this? Yeah, so uh, to answer this question, the question that, uh, you know, I'm able to understand or perceive uh, uh, is that, uh, the user is trying to ask whether we are using what kind of models or what are the models built upon or the, what kind of or what kind of data are we using for training such models so uh, starting with the model we are we have arcgis learn module um, in that we have various kinds of models available 
um i think if you could provide an api reference link so users can easily uh, um, you know hover through the different models available and these yeah. models are uh, yeah are built within yeah. our our um, team and uh, for data we use either the open source data or we uh, create our own, own training data so that's how we have been uh, using these models or building these models yeah okay thanks priyanka uh webov i'll pass on the final two questions to you the first one is how effective this model is on non metal roads so yeah so to answer this i think you are talking about the multi task road extractor so we have seen it uh, work with the uh, roads uh, uh, in desert area basically so you can try it and let us know i think it will work because multi task road extractor actually works well with linear feature uh like uh, so basically i think uh, it should work fine yeah okay could you use the road detector for sidewalks yes again as sidewalks are uh, mostly linear feature so yes you can uh, you can train a model for that and for that uh, we have added a clone of multitask road detector called connectnet so you can use that or you can also use multitask road extractor mod model itself yeah thanks webov well this brings us to the end of the session thanks for joining in and we hope you have a wonderful experience at the summit in case you have any additional queries feel free to post them on ask our experts python section thank you